on uh, some of the basics of philosophical writing. We're also going to cover some background concepts that you're going to encounter all over the place in your coursework. Uh, so for some of you, this is going to be review. For some of you, this might be the first time you're encountering some of these concepts. Uh, either way, feel free to stop us, raise your hand if you want us to pause, back up, whatever. Uh, so this is, yeah, for you, and questions are welcome throughout. So, do you want to get started? All right, yeah, let's get started. So, uh, we have a two-part workshop. Uh, today, we're going to do three things, explaining key philosophical terms, we're going to introduce you to the basics of formal arguments, and then we're going to discuss some of the fundamentals of philosophical writing. And then next time, we'll talk about how to read uh, a philosophy paper, how to approach that, some techniques. Um, and specifically, when you're trying to reconstruct the argument that's happening in a paper, where you need to stand back and say, what are they really doing? How are they really defending this? Um, and we'll talk next week about how best to do that, if, say, in preparation for writing a paper, analyzing one of these arguments. And before uh, you come back for next week's seminar, we're actually going to distribute a short segment uh, from a classic piece of philosophy, so we'll be working through that together as a group. Okay, so let's get started. Key philosophical terms. Um, you're basically going to encounter over and over again two moral theories. The first is consequentialism. What is consequentialism? Well, it's any moral theory that says that the only thing that matters to whether an action is right is its consequences. Now, most commonly when we're talking about consequentialist theories, we're talking about utilitarianism. So what is utilitarianism? It's consequentialism, so it's a theory that says that the rightness of actions, actions are determined by their consequences, plus another theory, hedonism. Hedonism says that the only thing that's good in itself, or the only thing that's intrinsically valuable, is pleasure, alternatively, we might say happiness, flourishing, well-being, um, some concept in that vicinity. And so uh, we put these two things together, we're going to end up with a moral theory that says that an action is right um, according to utilitarianism if it maximizes um, pleasure, happiness, flourishing, well-being. You're going to encounter all these terms. People use them fairly synonymously. And so one way to think about this is that if we say that we're, that we're consequentialists, it leaves a sort of open question. We know that we want to create the best consequences, but you won't know how to do that unless you specify what the consequences are. And utilitarianism is just one way of specifying what, the, what counts as good consequences. Um, it says, well, what counts as good consequences? That's whichever ones produce the most pleasure, happiness, flourishing, and so on. Any questions about that? Feeling great? Right? Okay. All right. So uh, the other moral theory that you're going, oh, oh yeah, okay, wait, um, slides. Um, so one thing that's worth flagging before we talk about the next moral theory is this distinction between intrinsic and instrumental value that's also going to come up in your readings. So there are two ways in which something can be valuable or good. It can be valuable in itself, also known as intrinsically valuable or non-instrumentally valuable. And it can be valuable instrumentally, so that it can be valuable for the consequences it helps produce, or not intrinsically. So here are two examples. Well, money is instrumentally valuable. Why do we know that? Well, take any currency that suddenly loses its buying power, you suddenly have something that's not valuable. Right? So the value of money is located in the things you're able to do with it, the consequences that are able to come from it. So it's going to be instrumentally valuable. Um, in contrast, uh, happiness seems to be intrinsically valuable, or valuable for its own sake. Why? Because if I ask you what's good about happiness, you can answer that by just saying it, it makes you happy, or it's happy. You know, like, you know, if you've had the experience of happiness, you know that that's a good experience in and of itself. Next moral theory? Yep. Any questions about this distinction before we move on? Okay, so it will come up um, in your readings over the course of the next semester. Yeah, and a lot of this, obviously there's more that could be said about any of these theories. We just want to get the sort of the general familiarity so that when you encounter these terms, you're not wondering what's going on with them. But I'm sure that you know, more questions will come up along the way. Okay, so the next moral theory that you will encounter over and over again is deontology. And when we're talking about deontology, we're actually talking about a class of views um, that are fairly different from each other in a lot of ways. Um, but what they have in common is that the people who espouse them believe that there's something that matters to determining which actions are right apart from consequences. So, for example, they might think that we have duties or obligations 
Um, there are things we just must do or must not do, even if they don't produce the best consequences. So one example um, might involve not torturing. So a lot of people think there's an obligation never to torture innocent people, even if it would produce good consequences. Um, and this would be the kind of case where consequentialists and deontologists might reach different conclusions about what actions are moral. Um, so consequentialists might say, sure, usually it wouldn't produce good consequences to torture an innocent person. But there might be some cases where you could torture a person in order to extract information that would save other people's lives. Um, so the consequentialist might say, well, in that case, go ahead and torture. And the deontologist might say, even if it would produce better consequences, there are just some rules you should never break. Um, and that would be the kind of case where, where these might have a part. Yeah? This word actually came up in our reading for this week. And I looked it up because I had no idea what it meant. And it said, the nature and study of duty. Yeah, it doesn't seem to fit in what, like the duty of what you had, you know, your the nature of science or study of looking at somebody who feels like they have to do something. Yeah, that doesn't really, that doesn't really gel with what I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's a word that gets used different ways. Yeah. Um, you could use it to talk about just sort of studying duties. Um, the way it gets used in moral philosophy usually is sort of as a blanket term for a bunch of different theories that disagree with consequentialism. And the connection, the reason that sort of the same word gets used this way is that it often is theories that think what we morally ought to do is, is a matter of duties. Um, but it's not going to just be the study of those duties. It would be a, a view about what kinds of moral responsibilities we have. But yeah, you're right. It's a word that pops up in different contexts um, being used different ways. So, Any other questions? Yeah. Why is torturing no right? Isn't that because we're harming somebody? So harming is a consequence, right? So it could be it could be right or wrong for a bunch of different reasons. A consequentialist might think that it was wrong in some cases um, because it reduced the amount of happiness and caused there to be uh, ca just cause worse consequences. So the kinds of reason you're mentioning might be one reason, um, but there could be other reasons. Um, so people might think, for example, that um, just as a matter of respect for human dignity. Um, that you can never torture, um, even, even if that would produce better consequences. Um, or sometimes people think that you should be more concerned with what kinds of actions you take um, than with sort of the state of the world as a whole. So a consequentialist might think, all right, I'm going to run a bunch of calculations, and if I cause this one person pain and suffering, maybe these other people will have less suffering and it'll balance out. And some deontologists might say, hold on, no. Um, you, shouldn't be, you shouldn't be trying to run those kinds of calculations and balance it out. Just worry about you yourself not hurting anybody else, um, even if there are ways that you might be able to produce other effects. Just worry about you not hurting people. Um, and so that might be another reason it would come up. Um, and I should say, deontologists can still care about consequences. They just don't think they're the only thing that matters. Any questions before we move on? So uh, keep in mind, we're giving very rough characterizations of two prominent moral views. Uh, in your readings throughout your courses, you're going to want to defer to the philosopher you're reading to understand how exactly it is that they're understanding the theory that they're invoking because there is going to be differences uh, in terms of how philosophers apply and understand these background theories. Uh, but this should at least give you a sense of the jargon and a sense of the broad breakdown between these two camps that you're going to encounter. OK. Just yeah. real quick, so and these are like, two main broad moral theories. Um, in your opinion, though, if you were to say how many major moral theories there are that are out there, there would be like, Five, six, is it infinitum or you know what I mean? Like, oh, I know there's so like virtue. Uh, you know, yeah. Right. So it'll depend exactly how you how you cut things up. Certainly there are going to be lots of influential moral theories. Um, these are both broad enough characterizations that a lot of the influential moral theories could get categorized as one of the two of these. Very, some of the other stuff that comes up, some people will talk about, uh, about virtue ethics as sort of another ethical tradition. It's fairly different, though, because it's asking a different question. It's sort of asking what makes a good person, what good character is, rather than what actions to take. 
theories of what actions to take. A lot fall under this, but certainly there are, you know, there are theories that sort of rebel from this and go off in other different directions. But but these these two are the ones that you'll sort of see over and over again as as sort of more influential than, than pretty much anything else you encounter. Okay, so uh, let's move on. Uh, Deontologists, as we said, uh, think that there's something that matters to whether an action is right or wrong apart from its consequences. So generally speaking, they're going to give us a theory of what else there is that's intrinsically good, right? Um, they typically aren't hedonists. They usually think that there's something other than pleasure, happiness, um, that's morally relevant, that's uh, important to determining whether an action is right or wrong. So typically, you'll find deontologists are talking about things like autonomy, duties, and rights. So we're just going to briefly introduce uh, these three concepts uh, before we uh, move on. So let's start with autonomy. So the thought here is that we can be talking about a person's ability to, to self-govern. Um, this could mean just being free from coercion. Um, so we might say someone has autonomy if no one's restricting their ability to choose their own life path, um, be able to control what it is that they do. Uh, autonomy also sometimes gets referred to as their capacity. So we might say someone has autonomy um, if they're able to reason, if they're able to make choices for themselves. Um, you know, so we might say someone who's in a coma lacks, lacks autonomy, not because someone's coercing them, um, but because they're not conscious, they're not able to make choices for themselves. Um, so some deontologists think that one of the things that's really important um, is autonomy, is being able to choose our own life path. So if you hear someone say, look, even if I end up hurting myself, even if I make bad choices, it's just really important to me that I'm making my own choices, that I'm leading my own life. Um, that would be the kind of value that's being referenced here. So a deontologist will often invoke autonomy to explain uh, what sorts of duties and obligations we have. So they might say, Look, there are certain ways in which uh, you might treat a person that's just inconsistent with their status as autonomous beings. To understand how it is that we ought to treat people, we have to recognize that they're autonomous, that they're capable of making their own decisions, and uh, conform our behavior in re uh, relation to that fact. So let's move on to the next concept, uh, duties. So here we have a distinction between negative and positive duties. Um, negative duties are just obligations we have to refrain from doing something. Um, so that could be not killing, not stealing, things like that. Um, positive duties are obligations that we have to actively do something. Um, so obligations to provide someone with food or obligations to provide someone with medical care. Uh, and you know, there are various debates about exactly how to draw those lines, but roughly those are the two concepts that will, that will pop up again and again. And there will be live debates about what our duties are, right, and what they're responsible to, yeah. right? So there might be a you know, question in environmental ethics. Do we have duty to animals, or do we have a duty to preserve the natural world? Um, so the, the question of you know, which duties we actually have is an open question that we can explore through uh, our readings through this program. So the second con or third concept we wanted to touch on um, was rights. And once again, you have a distinction between negative and positive rights. What's a negative right? It's a right not to have something done to or for you by another person, right? So I have a right to not be harmed by people. I have a right to you know, not have something stolen from me. That's you know, what we're talking about when we're talking about negative rights. We can also talk about positive rights. And these are rights that we have uh, to have something done to or for us by another person. So when somebody says there's a universal right to health care, they're usually talking about a positive right. They're saying, I have a right to have other people um, provide me with a functional health care system. Likewise, when we talk about a right to education, we're often talking about a positive right. We're saying, I have a right, you know, people in general have a right to be provided with an education. So those are three concepts that are going to come up in relation uh, to deontologists. Are there any questions? I can see one already. Okay. So this whole ethics thing is brand new to me. Yeah. So I'm still trying to figure out. Yeah, it's completely fine. That's, yeah. that's what the workshop's for. <laughs> so I just want to be clear. So someone who falls under the whole deontology theory would yeah. use things like autonomy and rights 
as a reason to argue for something being done or not done. Like the whole ethics thing, would say, well, it's going to you know, give you autonomy, therefore it should be. Is that, is that kind of where that's my life is in right? No, you're right. totally in the right ballpark. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, what we're doing here, we're not providing the full argument behind right. any of this. These are just sort of the concepts they would end up employing when they're making the argument. But yeah, you're exactly right. That these are the kinds of concepts they would use. They would say, well, because of considerations of autonomy or because of considerations of rights, there's this thing that we just must do for someone or must not do for someone. And they could apply this to like almost anything that they're arguing regarding environment or health or anything. Yeah, so use these potentially. Okay. Right. So they have to. They have to. Depending on how exotic they're getting with their rights and duty talk, they have to argue for the existence of right. these rights. Right. So like I can't say like you know I can't uncontroversially say oh of course we have a right to the natural world right or of course we have or sorry of course we have a duty to insects or something, right? I have to argue for that claim. Um, but it's a claim that like people will argue about. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, yeah. I feel I also feel like you don't like a deontologist, like I would be a deontologist in so many respects, but then sometimes I'll be posed with something and be like, nah, consequentialism now. But so I can't see that. that. Because I'm not a very like. <laughs> but in fact, that's yeah. in your argument. If you're a uh, Oh yeah. If I was if I was making an argument like in an essay, I would probably stick to one. But then also say here are some consequential arguments. But yeah. in real life, like I would be flexible. And I would okay. Just say that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I mean, this is where it gets complicated because you have people who are pluralists of various sorts. So they try to combine insights from both theories and say like, look. We can come up with this larger theory that explains why, in certain circumstances, we ought to care about duties and rights, and in other certain circumstances, we ought to defer to consequences. Um, but that's like a development on these two theories. You still have to have like kind of a grasp of them before you uh, start to look at how they might be able to be configured together. Feel free to ask me about this later. I actually I've written a little bit about what to do in some of those cases. I don't want to sort of take us too far afield in the workshop, uh, but I'd be I'd be definitely happy to chat about it. So, uh, just let me know if I'm on the right track here. When I think of deontology, I think of the golden rule, right? That you shouldn't do to others what you wouldn't want done to yourself. And so that would encapsulate the parameters. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. And that would, be, that would be an example of a deontological theory. Yeah, right. Uh, it gives you a duty that you ought to conform your actions to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, and if you're, oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, so often with these concepts, we're fairly familiar with them outside of philosophy. We just don't name them, right? So we. We all know what the golden rule is, right? And we all know that the like sometimes we apply the golden rule even in cases where the consequences would be better if we didn't. Um, we might not be thinking in terms of these two big moral theories, but they do butt heads in our non-philosophical lives all the time. Yeah, or when people talk about, well, does the end justify the means? That's the kind of debate we would be having here. Uh, the consequentialists are the people who are going to say, yeah, yeah, if it's a if it's a better end, do it. Um, and the deontologist would be the one saying, well. The end doesn't always justify the means. Maybe, maybe there's something else that we need to be worrying about. Um, and I guess also just to sort of flag names of a few authors that you might hear um, coming up with some of these. When people talk about Immanuel Kant, uh, he's sort of one of the classic examples of a deontologist. Um, if people talk about uh, Peter Singer or Jeremy Bentham, John, um, John Stuart Mill, those are sort of classic examples of, of consequentialists. All right. Sure. Okay. Feeling covered with the distinction. Yeah, so I mean, it'll be refined as we do more readings, but this gives you a sense of the terrain. So we thought we'd kind of demonstrate how these two theories can butt heads with each other by looking at a classic debate that comes up all over bio bioethics, uh, the paternalism debate. So just to set the stage, there are two types of paternalism. There's soft paternalism, that's the view that paternalism is only justified when someone is temporarily or permanently lacking in autonomy, or when there's no possible non-paternalistic action that you can perform. So examples of actions that would be permissible to the soft paternalist, pushing someone away from oncoming traffic, you don't have time to warn them, so you just override their autonomy, push them out of the way. Um, making decisions for somebody with advanced Alzheimer's. You can say, look, this person doesn't actually have the capacity to reason about what to do. They lack autonomy, so it's permissible for us to paternalistically intervene and make decisions for them. Now, most people are pretty okay with soft paternalism. 
where the debate really gets started is in uh, issues relating to hard paternalism. Hard paternalism is the view that paternalism can actually be justified even when it's directed towards a well-informed autonomous agent. So imagine you have a patient that says, look, I know, you know all the medical facts. I know what's going to happen to me if I don't take this medication. Um, I know that you know, I'll have a heart attack in the next few months or you know, whatever, fill in the story as you wish. Um, but you know, the medication cramps my style. I don't like carrying around a pill bottle. You know, it's a pain. Uh, I, you know, whatever, it makes me less hip. The heart paternalist might step in and say, no, this is a case where we can compel you. Like, you're, you might be autonomous, but you're kind of an idiot, and we're going to look out for your best interests. Um, whereas someone who's unsympathetic to that, who will say, look, we have to respect your autonomy, even when you're kind of doing a bad job of things, is going to say, we have to back off and let you make decisions for yourself, even when they're bad ones. So you can see that the deontologist is going to really struggle with issues of hard paternalism, right? insofar as hard paternalism involves overriding someone's autonomy. Whereas the consequentialist will often say, yeah, hard paternalism is totally fine in cases where it's going to produce the best consequences. Um, if overriding your autonomy will produce the best consequences in this case, we're good to go. Any questions so far? This is all like theoretical, because yeah. I live with a very here and now yeah, yeah. world. Like, so this is all just we're arguing. This is not like, I mean, I, I'm, I don't know. I'm having a hard time putting that into like the real world. But yeah. we're not working in the real world this time. No, no, I mean, but we wanted to have implications for the real world. So these are, I think this being a tidy distinction is, mm -hmm. is sort of hypothetical. Um, it makes it easier to, to discuss if we simplify it and we say, all right, imagine the, the case where it's clear that someone has um, has the capacity to make the decisions or clear that they don't. Um, but I do think, I mean, you know, you can, you may be able to speak to this more, but then these kinds of questions come up, sort of how much can you interfere with someone's, um, someone's stated missions, how much can you interfere um, with the kinds of decisions that someone wants to make if you think they're making bad decisions. And I take it that's a very real world debate. Uh, that we do wonder if someone's making bad decisions, but they seem to understand the issue. They just draw a weird conclusion. Um, should we, you know, how much should we force them to make a different decision? Um, and where the line between these gets fuzzy, and I think a lot of real world cases, when people are making bad decisions, we might wonder, do they really understand? Do they really have the capacity for reasoning that's required? Um, and so someone might think, well, I'm okay with cases that are clearly soft paternalism, and I'm opposed to cases that are clearly hard paternalism, but where the hard cases come up is, where's the line? What do we do with the cases that seem a little fuzzy and you can't tell whether it's more like a soft case or more like a hard case? And so I think sort of as you get into some of the debates over the course of the program, that's where a lot of, I think, the interesting conversations will end up happening. Um, is in that fuzzy space between them, where you think, well, they can reason kind of, and they sort of understand this, but they're making pretty bad choices, and I'm not sure that they really get it. So, I mean, this also comes up at a policy issue, right? So think about, like, the soda tax, um, or, like, any cases in which we might nudge people towards certain uh, decisions, right? Or, you know, maybe we could ban SUVs, right? The responses are usually, like, you know, don't infringe on my ability to live how I want, right? They're saying, hey, I'm an autonomous agent. Let me make decisions for right. myself. And so like physician-assisted suicide yeah. is, is a good example of when someone wants to make their own decision, their own choice, and they're either not able because of the policy, mm -hmm. or, uh, or they are able, and then you get into that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that would certainly be a case where some of these same debates arise. Yeah, so I mean, versions of this debate you'll see in different contexts, but it illustrates the conflict between a theory that says consequences are what matter, and a theory that says, no, there are certain types of actions that are just wrong, right, that fail to respect us as people, as autonomous beings. So now let's move on to the second thing that we wanted to cover, um, which had to do with arguments. And the thought here is that when you're, when you're looking at a philosophy paper or, or writing one of your own, typically they'll be making some kind of argument. Um, they'll, be, they'll be giving you some conclusion, some claim that they want to defend, um, and a set of reasons um, in support of that conclusion. 
Uh, and we want to talk a little bit about just how that's structured. Uh, because when we, um, when we do say, all right, we're going to critique this argument, I think this author has reached the wrong conclusion, they've given, they, they haven't supported their point, uh, you're going to want to be able to think about exactly what went wrong. Um, and then in turn, when you're constructing your own arguments in your own papers, you're going to want to think about, all right, how exactly should I put this together? What sorts of reasons would do a good job of supporting my conclusion? Uh, so if you say in the debate we were just talking about, you wanted to argue that hard paternalism was wrong or that a particular kind of case constituted an instance of impermissible hard paternalism, what you'd want to be able to do is step back and say, all right, what sorts of reasons should I give in support of that argument? Which ones would constitute good support and which ones just wouldn't be very persuasive? Um, so that's why we're going to talk a little bit just about how arguments come together. So there are different ways that we can talk about arguments. Um, one is a fairly formal way. So you can take an argument that's prevent, uh, presented in a philosophy paper and divide it into premises, which are just reasons in support of the conclusion, and the conclusion. So what is the argument giving you? It's giving you a bunch of reasons to believe some claim, the conclusion. And there are two ways that we can assess the strength of an argument. We can talk about whether an argument is valid. And this is a formal test that has to do with the structure of the argument itself. You're going to see this in a second. What's validity? Well, it's this. If all the premises are true, then the conclusion must also be true. Now, validity just has to do with the structure of the argument, the way it's set up. right? So it has nothing to do with the content yet. When we want to talk about the content of an argument, whether it's an argument like you know that's actually persuasive given um, the reasons that it offers. We can talk about soundness. We can say, okay, once we've established the arguments valid, are the premises actually true? That is, um, you know, do we have reason to believe the premises? Because if they are, and the argument's valid, then we automatically need to believe the conclusion. So here are some uh, just brief elaboration on validity. Once again, if all the premises are true, the conclusion must also be true. So what do you do? You test. You say, I'm going to assume that all of the premises are true. I'm not actually going to figure out whether they are or not. And then I'm going to ask myself, is there any possible way that this conclusion could be false? If the answer is yes, if I can think of a way, then the argument isn't valid. And if the answer is no, then the argument is valid. So here's an example. Um, if Jordan works really hard, she'll make it to the WNBA. Jordan works really hard. Therefore, Jordan will make it to the WNBA. This is like a funny example, or I was attempting. Um, so if we just look at the structure of the argument, um, imagine that these two premises are true. Um, they're clearly not. I don't work hard. And even if I did, I'm not going to make it. it I'm not going to have a basketball career. Um, but imagine that they're both true. Well, the conclusion automatically follows. It just follows from the structure of the argument, which just says, if A, then B, A, therefore B, right? Um, doesn't really matter what you sub in for that. You're always going to have a valid argument. But of course, validity you can sort of purchase on the cheap. It's pretty easy to come up with valid arguments. The gold standard you want is soundness. You want an argument that's actually compelling, that actually has true premises. So how are we doing your time? Um, it's, it's six. six. Right. So that should be fine. Yeah, so I'll just. Um, so, what you want to do when you're determining soundness, first figure out if the argument is valid. Um, then, if it is, you have to do the work of determining whether the premises are true. So here's a classic argument. All human fetuses are persons. It's always wrong to kill a person. Therefore, it's always wrong to kill a fetus. So first step, is this valid? If the premises were true, is the conclusion necessarily true? What do you guys think? Yeah. 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 You're classifying a fetus as a person, and you've already right. put the premise that it's wrong to be a person. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. So we've gotten validity. Can you say that again? No. I was. Yeah. Oh. I'm sorry. Okay, I was just saying that the conclusion is true because we've already established that we constitute a fetus as a person, and then we've already said that it's wrong to kill a person, so thereby killing a fetus. Now, validity has nothing to do with whether the premises are actually true or false. Right? We're just looking at the structure. And structurally, this is a valid argument. If it turns out that the premises are true, then the conclusion necessarily follows. 
but we have to now do the hard work of determining whether these premises are true. And this is where philosophical debate is going to come into things, right? So we're going to have, we can have an argument or you know, a discussion about whether fetuses are persons. Well, what is it to be a person? And you know, however we define that, does that apply to fetuses? Um, we can also have a discussion about whether it's always wrong to kill a person, or whether there are principal distinctions that we can draw, you know, consequential distinctions. Right? So soundness is what you want, and that's also the hard thing to get. Um, and so the, pers the kinds of questions that we're asking here, where we say, are fetuses really persons? Um, is it really wrong to kill a person? Those are questions we'd have to answer to determine whether it's sound. Um, because soundness would require that these both be true, um, in addition to this being a valid argument. Did it? Yeah. So for a strong philosophical paper, you need validity and soundness. OK, but then I'm having trouble, I guess, understanding the exact difference between the two, because they sound very similar. So validity just has to do with the structure, not the content. Oh. Right? So imagine, like, take up any noun and just replace it with A or B or C, mm -hmm. right? It just has to do with the structure. It has nothing to do with the content. Soundness is validity plus premises that are actually true. Right? This is what you're hoping to achieve in your philosophical argumentation. It's also like the holy grail of philosophy. It's really hard to like, you know, uh, come to a consensus on what arguments are sound. But that's what you're going to be um, trying to do in a lot of your work. Um, now, often we're doing this in less formal ways, right? So you might get, you know, see an argument that doesn't have premises and a conclusion clearly identified. Just gives you a bunch of claims, and you have to figure out how they fit together and whether they actually do, right? And that's you know we'll get into that a little bit more next week. Um, but generally speaking, in your own work, you want to come up with arguments that are not only valid but are actually sound, right? Or at least the feature premises that you can actually give some support for. And I think part of why this is valuable too is in what we're assessing other people's arguments. Um, drawing this distinction can help us to figure out what's really going wrong in an argument that we disagree with. Um, because there are some arguments where you might say, well, oh, this seems superficially persuasive. If I go through all the steps with them, I do end up at their conclusion. Um, and what might be going on there is you might be running into an argument that really is valid, where if you, if you bought into everything that they were assuming up front, you really would be stuck with their conclusion. Um, but you might need to stand back and say, hold on a minute. I know the validity is different than soundness. Um, you smuggled in some assumptions at the very beginning that were false. And that's why um, your conclusion is wrong, even though it looks like you went through all the right steps. Um, and so that's part of why it's worth being aware of the difference. So how are we feeling about this? Um, these are concepts that will be reinforced um, throughout, and you know, you'll get to deal with a lot of arguments. So if you're feeling like this isn't quite clicking, or you know, I don't really see how this applied to the, you know, totally convoluted paper that I just had to read over the weekend, um, that's okay. That's part of you know, the aim of the program, um, to get you thinking more critically about arguments. And we'll also talk more next time about how you, should, how you could pull an argument out of a particular reading, um, where we'll have you read a short passage and really just sort of map out some of the considerations coming out of it. Um, so that may help also. Any questions about that right now? Would you say it's generally make a stronger argument or paper to argue against um, a, another paper's like soundness rather than validity because it's simply yeah. yeah. So I mean, validity. Most of the time, the arguments that you encounter are going to be valid. Yeah. Um, validity is really easy, um, and sometimes you just have to tweak the argument a little bit to uh, make it valid. Right. The real interesting philosophical questions have to do with whether. It's a sound argument. That is, whether the premises that lead to the conclusion it's trying to bring you to are actually premises that you have good reason to believe. Um, so yeah, so typically speaking, when you're, when you're writing a paper, you're going to be trying to assess whether it's a sound argument that you know, somebody else has offered, or you're going to be trying to offer an argument that is yourself, uh, is sound. Yeah. And I think there may be some cases where, where your problem would come with uh, just sort of arguing that it's not even valid. Mm -hmm. Although, as you mentioned, one thing you might want to do in those cases, um, if you think, oh, I read this article and it's not even a valid argument, one thing you might do, as Jordan was suggesting, is step back and say, is there a small adjustment that would make it valid? Uh, maybe I can then assess that version of it, and maybe that can be a way of being charitable to the author. But in determining the soundness, like even this example here with the fetus, I don't know that anyone like can, there are lots of ways you can approach that. Yep. 
So is there ever really a right answer? Like, who is, who is anyone to determine? You know, you can have somebody say, well, scientifically, blah, 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 but then somebody comes at it from a religious end. Yep. So, you know, so there's never really a right, like, black and white. I mean, can, is that the whole point of this? <laughs> I mean, is, there's, those are going to be really, really hard questions to answer. I don't think that means there isn't a right answer. Um, it may mean that it's just going to be very hard to get agreement on an answer. Um, so in the same way that there can be scientific truths that it takes people centuries to figure out, um, but that once they figure them out, it turns out there is some fact of the matter. Um, and people disagree about this with morality. Some people think there's a fact of the matter, uh, but there's just a lot of debate and it's hard to figure out the fact of the matter. Other people think there really is no fact of the matter. But a lot of what we'll be doing in this program is trying to figure out what sorts of reasons you would give in support of these claims or against these claims, um, and what would count as better or worse reasons. Because I think often, even if there's not a clear consensus on the right answer, um, we can have a sense that certain kinds of arguments are persuasive and count as good reasons that other people should take seriously. Um, and that other kinds of reasons or arguments might seem flippant or unpersuasive. Um, and so even if it's not if it's not cut and dry, there can still be better and worse ways to approach it. Um, could you exchange soundness with coherence, for instance, or is that a different concept? Um, so soundness is just a technical term that we've stood, like you know philosophers stipulate. Um, so I'd say coherence is maybe closer to validity. Okay. Um, but it's but yeah, these ultimately are pretty much just technical terms. Yeah. Um, all right. Should we? See, it's uh, it's six oh eight now. Okay, so we should probably Perfect move time. forward. Yeah. Uh, so, so we. Oh yeah. Okay. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna pass these around. You can go. Ahead. Is um, how to pick and choose what details are actually relevant. 
to explaining the thing, the argument that you want to explain, right? So as Chelsea said, you're not going to do a step-by-step -step reconstruction of a 30-page paper because that gives you a 30-page explanation. Um, you're going to um, work on honing in on the important parts of the, the paper, the article, right? Um, and understanding what it is that you actually need to communicate to your reader in order to get, um, you know, the main gist of the ar ar argument across. So, I do want to say there are sort of these two distinct tasks that are worth keeping in mind. If you're giving an explanation, make sure both that it's clear what the conclusion is, um, and also that it's clear how the conclusion is supported. Uh, so this will be what kinds of assumptions are being made, the sorts of things that we're referring to as premises up here. Um, what would the reader need to buy in advance if they're going to, to buy the conclusion? But also, um, you want to talk about how this is all supposed to fit together. Um, what, sorts of, what sorts of explanations would cause the reader to jump from those initial assumptions to the conclusion the author is, is making? So if it's a process of elimination argument, um, you, in your explanation, you would want to say that. You would say, this author is uh, arguing using process of elimination. They go through these steps. This is how they get from these assumptions to this conclusion. Uh, those are those are the kinds of the kinds of moves you would want to make sure were clear uh, in your explanation. So, any questions about that component of philosophy papers? Feeling good right now? Okay. What, good. what percentage of? Good question. Down. Yeah. So that's a um, that's a fantastic question. It's going to depend on the paper. So you might have a paper where you're dealing with a really complex argument and. You know, 60% of what you say is just trying to get clear on what the author's saying. That's a project in and of itself. You might have a paper where the central argument is fairly easy to reconstruct. You can get that over in a page, and then you move on to the second um, component, the critique. Now, what you don't want is an argument that's all explanation, right? Because, you know, this is, we want to see your argumentation, not just your ability to reconstruct somebody else's. So you don't want a project that's just purely describing someone else's. You want to do something. Right, so the second part of the paper is going to be crucial, even if the you know amount of you know, the paper that it takes up will depend on the project. Yeah, and it will also depend a little bit on the assignment. So if you're if you're doing an extended final paper, for example, you might have explanations of a couple of different authors' work um, that are playing into the analysis that you're giving. Um, if you're writing a shorter paper um, or a final paper that's zooming in on one author's uh, one author's article, um, then you might have just that, just an explanation of that one piece. Um, but this is also, I guess, part of why I sometimes warn students about trying to bring in um, too many different uh, too many different authors or too many different considerations. You want you want to make sure that you can explain uh, the pieces that you're talking about. Uh, but yeah, in general, sort of, it'll depend on the particulars. But if you're writing a 15-page paper and 13 pages are explaining someone else's argument, something's gone wrong. Uh, so that's sort of a, a general rule of thumb. So the second portion of um, the philosophy papers that you'll typically be writing um, is the critique, right? And the por purpose, um, the purpose of this portion of the paper, wow, that's hard to say, is to provide uh, the reader with a critical assessment of the arguments. So that doesn't mean it's to disagree with the arguments, right? What it is is to provide the reader with reasons for and against believing the arguments, and ultimately to settle one way or another whether the argument's persuasive. So from the get-go, one thing that's worth emphasizing, when you're critically engaging or when you're critiquing an argument, don't go after the conclusion. The conclusion just follows from the premises, right? Go after the premises. They're your target. Um, why? Because if you can show that they're both, you know, they're all true, or you can show that at least one of them's false, then you don't have to worry about the conclusion at all, because they haven't given you um, the reasons that they need to get you to the conclusion. This is a mistake that people commonly make when they're writing their first philosophy papers. Um, though I see people making moves like this. Well, I agree with every step in Thompson's argument except the conclusion. Well, no, if you agree with every step in Thompson's argument and the argument's valid, the conclusion just follows. Um, more likely, something went wrong somewhere, like, you know, you feel like you agree, but there's something fishy, right? And the, your task is to determine what, where that fishiness is, what it is about the argument that makes it the case that the conclusion still isn't persuasive to you. And that can make your work a lot more persuasive, uh, because if you take the reader through a bunch of steps that seem to reach a particular conclusion, 
And then you just say, for unrelated reasons, I hate the conclusion. The reader's left kind of confused because they still heard all of those things that looked like good reasons for the conclusion. The work you need to do, do is go back and tell them those things that look like good reasons, here's what's actually wrong with them. Yeah. Um, and that's what's going to dispel some of that confusion for the reader. Yeah, so you also argue that you agree. Yeah, like, yeah. Totally. You go through and, and say, you know, this premise makes sense to me because. Yeah. Versus I don't agree because. 100%. Yeah, um, you can so, go either way. Um, what and if you agree with some and not with others? I mean, how do you fit the conclusion? <laughs> so if you, if you disagree with some of the premises, you probably end up um, having to say that the argument isn't sound, um, because it would mean that sort of some of the supports that they needed to reach their conclusion um, don't work out. You might still like the conclusion for other reasons, so you don't have to reject the conclusion. But you would probably need to say that their argument doesn't end up supporting it. So one thing you can do um, to give a, a useful, uh, useful paper that's, um, that's agreeing with the argument is to defend it against a powerful objection. Um, so that would be one way where you could still be adding to the conversation um, and making an original point, um, rather than just sort of going down a checklist and saying what you like. Um, so you might say, here's this argument, here's a major challenge that someone might pose to it, here's why someone might have doubts about it, um, and here's how I can come in and save the argument from those doubts. Um, I think that's sort of a, a useful way to think about the agreeing papers. Yeah. Um, and it's perfectly fine to agree, right? Um, yeah. The goal isn't to like tear down every you know philosophical edifice that anybody in bioethics has ever built, right? Um, it's to move the case forward and to come up with arguments that are actually compelling. And as um, Chelsea said, one of the best ways to do that is to take an objection that might be looming large in another reader's mind and show that it's not persuasive. Remy, uh, when there are like multiple back and forth arguments, mm -hmm. finally, if I cannot come up with a reply, does it make my case weaker? Um, I mean, so one thing I often suggest people do in those situations is to say, this objection to my point is actually compelling. Um, I don't see a way around it, you know, but I still think the case is unsettled, or I still think more work needs to be done. And that's a way of saying, like, yeah, I understand that, you know, my hypothetical objector actually beat best at me in this round, um, but I don't think the, you know, uh, the game's over yet, or, you know, I think there's still more work, more theorizing needs to be done on this issue. Right, we're not expecting you to just settle every question that could possibly come up um, within the contours of one paper. Um, you just want to make it clear to clear where you're leading the reader. So I think the cases where it becomes a problem are cases where someone just says, here are some considerations, here are some other considerations, the end. Um, so if you're, if you're leaving open questions, I would just be really explicit that that's happening. So it's okay to say, so here's what I found compelling, but there are these objections that really do raise uh, significant difficulties, so I ultimately take this to be unsettled. Um, the fact that you're even saying, so I ultimately take this to be unsettled, that's itself a conclusion. It at least lets the reader know where you're leaving things and what's going on. OK, so how are we feeling about that part of the paper? Pretty good? Um, yeah, and, and one thing that's worth doing, uh, and we'll get to reading in a second, but as you read through philosophy papers, ask yourself to what extent they're actually succeeding in this, right? To what extent are they adequately explaining the arguments, you know, the, the other, you know, arguments that they're engaging with? To what extent are they raising the sorts of objections that one, you know, should reasonably raise to their position? You'll find that a lot of philosophers actually fall short of this, right? This isn't an easy task. It's not a task that you're going to master um, right away. Um, and it's, you know, it's a work in progress. So let's move on to organization. Uh, there are a few kind of hallmarks of um, philosophical writing uh, that are related to this topic and worth keeping in mind. The first is that a short introduction is never a bad thing. Um, a lot of the time, people feel like you know they need to start with these really bloated um, introductions. You know, since the dawn of time, man has been questioning ethical issues related to human enhancement. Um, don't. Uh, just get straight to your point. It's perfectly fine to say, this paper I'm going to discuss Singer's argument against speciesism. Um, and then maybe have a follow-up sentence. I'm first going to explain it, then I'm going to criticize it by saying blah, blah, blah. That can be an introduction. Those two sentences, perfectly fine if that's an introduction. As you go on to develop larger projects, you're going to have larger introductions. Um, but at the beginning, just keep it short and simple. Um, then typically uh, you can organize the body of your paper in a variety of ways. 
you're typically going to want the explanation to come before the critique, because if you reverse the order, then nobody really knows what you're critiquing. Um, and generally, you're going to want to be trying to organize your thoughts in a way that lead your reader naturally from one idea to another in a way that's uh, you know, logical and well-organized. And what that amounts to will really depend on uh, the topic at hand and how you're approaching it. I'm just going ahead and putting these up as you're okay. saying. Intro. And then just the explanation of the Yep. And then critique. And in the critique section, you're going to both want to raise um, you know, arguments and objections to those arguments and consider, you know, consider the strength of those objections. Um, Chelsea, right faster. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually just going to go ahead and draw a distinction because like, you're talking about these sort of two models where you might be objecting ultimately to the argument you're considering or you might be um, ultimately agreeing with it. So just in terms of how those two paths would go. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna say one path would be this one where you're raising the objection and then uh, consider, uh, then you consider possible replies um, that the author or someone supporting the author might make. Yeah, thank you. So would you take this same framework, like intro, explanation, critique, and then apply that to, let's say, like the thesis we have to do at the end of the semester. So that's a good question. Your thesis is going to be a more engaged topic, and it might be that this framework's like a little too simple for that. Um, but generally speaking, your thesis is going to require you to accomplish these two tasks, okay. right? And maybe you'll accomplish them three times, right? You'll be explaining three different things and also critiquing them, right? Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, you can take any paper and divide it between explanation sections and critique sections, even if you know you go back and forth a little bit, or you know the structure is a little more complicated than what we're presenting. But generally, you know, whenever you're writing a philosophically minded paper, you want to make sure it's accomplishing those two tasks: that it's explaining, you know, the thing that's under consideration, and that it's critiquing it. Yeah, in the thesis, it might be that you start with a much more general question. Um, but even then, you would sort of go through, all right, what are, what are some ways that people have answered this general question in the literature? Um, and then, why do I think that the available explanations aren't working? So maybe you know, there are three dominant theories of, of how to answer this question. I think none of them are quite satisfying. Here's why. Here's the alternative uh, theory I'm going to give that I think would be more satisfying, and, and here's why it works. Something like that. So there would still be the explanation and the critique, mm -hmm. um, but it would just be shaped a little differently. Did you want to explain the second Oh, part? sorry. So we have the intro, the explanation of the argument being critiqued. We were saying in one option, you're, you're raising the objection um, and then considering possible replies in defense of the author. But in this other option, you're saying, here's a possible challenge um, that someone might raise um, to the argument I'm discussing. Um, and, but here's how I'm going to come in and defend the author against that challenge. Uh, so they're really, they're going through similar steps, but leaving the reader in a different place. The one thing you want to make sure of when you're doing this paper is that this possible challenge is one worth taking seriously. Um, so you don't want to just raise um, a really trivial objection that no one would take seriously. Oftentimes we're reading these papers and these authors are writing these papers because these are hard controversial issues. Um, so you really want to think, okay, what are some of the reasons why someone would disagree with this article? Um, someone who is thoughtful, who is taking it seriously. And those are the kinds of objections that would be good ones to address in your papers. And you're going to round off your paper with a conclusion that, like the introduction, is short and sweet. Uh, it, you know, tells us where you landed in the paper. You know what you ultimately concluded yourself. Um, you know, maybe it flags a topic for possible investi you know, further investigation. But really, the conclusion shouldn't be substantive. It should just be wrapping up in a neat bow what you managed to do before. So, any questions about essays structurally? Okay, good. All right, so great. the last thing we wanted to cover, and we have four minutes, which is the perfect amount of time, um, is just some tips for writing philosophy. Um, philosophical writing, you know, bioethical writing, looks a little different than other sorts of humanities writing. So a lot of the time, if you're coming at this from, say, an English background, you know, a literature background or a history background, you might think, you know, what the heck are these people doing? Um, 
the first thing you're going to want to do throughout your papers is to find key terms um, that the reader might need uh, to understand precisely in order to get what you're saying. This doesn't mean define everything. I don't want, you know, by duty, I mean, you know, like if it's not rel that relevant to the paper. Uh, so generally speaking, you're going to want to define terms that might be unfamiliar to the reader or terms that might be familiar but that you're using in a very particular sense. Right, so if it's really important that the reader understand that by autonomy you mean this precise thing, make sure to communicate that. Um, yeah, but at the same time, if, um, if it's the sort of concept that readers would be familiar with as long as they've been doing some moral philosophy, um, then you're probably okay. So if, if you just mention consequentialism in passing, you don't need to define what it is, unless, again, as Jordan was mentioning, unless you're using it in a very specific way where, oh, this particular nuanced definition as opposed to this other way that people sometimes use it is going to make a difference here. That's when you want to give a definition. Or if it's a sort of unusual term um, that the reader really might not know. Yeah, so I mean, this is knowing what to define is a skill to develop like any other. You're going to do too much definition, you're going to not do enough, um, and eventually you'll settle somewhere nicely in the middle. Um, the second thing, and I want to just like emphasize this over and over again, uh, keep your writing as simple as possible. These ideas are hard enough. Don't make them harder um, by introducing really convoluted sentence structures and writing like you're some 19th century poet. Um, yeah, just work on communicating these really complicated ideas as clearly and concisely as possible. And that's going to be hard enough. Yeah. So in the papers that you gave us, a lot of times they would do an idea and then they would give like a simple example. Perfect. That's, 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 great. that's great. Yeah, yeah great. So like, look what they've just done. They've taken an idea that's fairly abstract and then they've gotten, given you a way to grasp it immediately with a nice clear example. Um, you'll also find writers that don't do that or that fail miserably in doing that. Like, not everyone you read in this program is going to follow these rules. Um, but the more you read, the more you realize how beautiful these rules are and how much better life would be if everyone did follow them. Uh, the third thing you want to do, and this is my, one of my pet peeves, avoid rhetorical questions. Um, if you raise a question, be prepared to answer it. Um, don't, you know, don't close off a paragraph by saying, you know, but can, you know, can we really know whether human enhancement is morally permissible? Well, tell me, you know, can we? Um, that's, that's, that's your job. Uh, don't, don't put that task on the reader. Um, answer the questions that you raise. Um, and generally speaking, the questions that you're raising, like that can help you guide the paper, right? You'll know, okay, these are the questions that are interesting, that are important to the reader. And similarly, um, you, because you do want to be giving as much help to the reader as possible, um, you're going to you're going to just want to give them as much guidance along the way. Um, so you don't want to leave the reader thinking, "Well, wait, did we just did we just change topics? What happened here?" Um, just be as explicit as possible about what's happening in every step. Yeah. So it is perfectly fine to say things like, "Having just explained X, I'm now going to argue Y." Like, I know it sounds like that's not pretty, you know, I want to be more subtle in my writing. No, don't be subtle. Um, it's, you know, tell me exactly where you are in a given project. Um, also, when you're kind of switching voices, you're raising some objections, you're giving responses, tell me when you're doing that. You know, an objector could argue, or someone sympathetic to the original position could say, blah, blah, blah. In response, blah, blah, blah. That lets me know whether the considerations that you're offering are considerations for or against a specific position. Um, and finally, and this is kind of um, a weird quirk about philosophical writing, it is perfectly acceptable to write in the first person. You can use I as much as you want. Um, be vain, yeah, be narcissist in your paper. Um, the third person, you're welcome to write in it if that's more comfortable, um, but generally speaking, a lot of the philosophy you read will be in the first person, and that is perfectly fine. I guess I would also add, I don't think it's on here, but avoid taking on too much. Um, I think one of the one of the things that I one of the pieces of feedback I most often give when I'm grading papers is try to do less. Um, so you'll um, you'll sometimes have papers where people thought, oh, there's so much to say about this, and then the paper becomes sort of a, a list of, well, there's this kind of problem and this kind of problem and this kind of problem, but none of them are really fully explained or explored. Um, oftentimes, it's better to do fewer things and really explain what's happening um, with each of the issues that you raise. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind as well. 
You know, the question of how much you should take on a philosophy paper is a question that you're going to have an easier time answering once you've written a few philosophy papers. And you're going to like misfire a few times, right? So you're going to take on way too much and have to restart a paper, you know, probably at least once. And you're also sometimes, well, less often, going to find yourself like, you know, in five pages, wow, I actually answered that and I still have five pages to go. Um, in that case, you know, just ten in the five pages. <laughs> um, because you're supposed to keep it simple. Um, it's a skill that you develop, so if you find yourself struggling with appropriate topics, um, we're here as resources, we can help guide you, but also keep in mind that there's just a learning curve for this, um, and people are going to kind of overshoot and undershoot um, as they develop the first philosophical papers. Yeah. And, uh, and going forward for next time, um, as we mentioned, we're going to be sending around um, a pretty short reading, just an excerpt from a longer piece. Um, that'll be something that we'll be sort of picking apart and working through the argument of here. Um, and as you read that, there's uh, some advice on the back of this handout uh, for just you know how you should how you should approach reading uh, pieces of philosophy. Yeah. Um, so one question, just a uh, kind of drive on citation. I know there are uh, various types. Mm -hmm. So um, you recommend one or another? Whatever you're most comfortable with. Yeah. I, I just keep it consistent throughout. Yeah, keep it consistent. You can ask particular professors if they have preferences. But philosophy as a field doesn't have uh, doesn't have a uniform system. I know there are some fields where, okay, if it's psychology, you're using APA citations. Yeah, right, right. Different philosophy journals have different preferences on this, so it's not it's not but, yeah, So is it okay to use uh, APA sure. if you're submitting to a philosophy journal? Uh, so the journal will tell the you. The journal okay. usually. Yeah. That's why I say it would, it would okay. depend on yeah. the journal. And invariably, yeah. you're going to have to change your thoughts. But um, for the, certainly for the papers you're handing in, just whatever format that you're most comfortable with and keep it consistent for us. <laughs> okay, All right. thanks so much for coming out, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.